If everyone will take their seat, I think we're ready to get started. Well, hi there. I'm Jim Schwartz. I'm the president of the uh, Dallas Jewish Historical Society, and I would like to welcome you this evening to the um, uh, to the Andrus Family Lecture Series of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. This is our second in the series for the year. We're so pleased that the Andrus Family is continuing our very popular lecture series, and tonight we have a wonderful, wonderful speaker and a story that I'm sure many of you have your version of and those of you that don't uh, are looking forward to hearing all about the uh, Frankfurt Sisters and the Page of Boy maternity story. Uh, the Dallas Jewish Historical Society was founded in 1971 originally to be the repository for all artifacts having to do with things Jewish in the greater Dallas area. And we'd like to think that we've become a lot more than that. Um, uh, we have a new executive director, who I hope many of you have met, uh, Deborah Polsky, who has brought a wonderful new energy to the organization. And we have great things planned. Um, you probably have seen us mention in the Dallas, uh, in the Texas Jewish Post, several times lately. We're gonna have a booth at the chili cook-off. Uh, this weekend, first time ever, and we have our uh, wonderful, we're resurrecting our wonderful Ann Sakura Humanitarian Award um, luncheon April 25th, so watch your mailboxes. We hope that uh, you'll be able to attend. Um, I'd like to now um, ask the magnificent Elia Naxon, our program chair, to come up and tell a little bit about tonight's program and introduce our speaker. The other thing magnificent is the fact that I've been doing this for 12 years, nobody else wants to take my place. <laughs> Welcome to another evening of our history series provided generously by the Andrus Family Lecture Series of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. It is my pleasure and my duty to introduce you to a woman who has a definite love of history, particularly Texas and the Southwest, as well as women as part of that history. Dr. Kay Goldman has degrees from Southwest Texas State where she graduated summa cum laude, and uh, Texas A&M where she earned a PhD in history. At present, she serves as the program coordinator of the Department of Biology and supervises the operations of the Graduate Advising Office. She has been a visiting professor of history at A&M. She's received many honors and numerous presentations in her field of history. In addition, Kay, has found time to write a book on Rebecca Meyer, 1852, called With a Doll in One Pocket and a Pistol in the Other. Now that sounds intriguing. I've got to get that book. Her forthcoming book is Designing Women, Texas Style, The Frankfurt Sisters of Dallas and Page Boy Maternity. Uh, the book is not out yet. It will be out in May, and she tells me that we have some forms if you want to pre-publication order for it. It's, uh, it's being um, published by the Texas Tech uh, University, Press. University Press and will be on uh, Amazon as well. Okay. Since we're all here to listen to her research, I gladly call upon Dr. Kay Goldman, our guest for the evening. <laughs> And uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we've got a magnificent uh, group here tonight. And I want to thank everybody for coming out to hear this story, which I think uh, when I realized that it, it had never been written about, I couldn't believe it. So I sought out information about this, this marvelous story. 
I also want to recognize that I know that there's a lot of family members here of the Frankfurt sisters family, and especially um, Ms. Gardner, who's here with us tonight. Thank you very much. Um, I know that many of you are probably very familiar with the story and knew the people that were involved. And I want to say this before we get started, um, that the account that I'm presenting here and that are included in, in the book are based on incidences that I can document. I know a lot of people have told me various <laughs> stories and what I've included in the, in the uh, actual book are the early stories and the ones that um, that I was able to uh, find two or three people that told me the same story. Because I can tell you that the stories that were published later on weren't all the same story. In 1937, two optimistic young women invested $500 and began a new business, designing and manufacturing maternity clothes. Within a few years, the business, Page Boy Maternity Clothing, became the foremost maternity clothing manufacturing concern in the United States. Its phenomenal growth also enabled a Dallas, Texas woman to become the first woman uh, inducted into the Young Presidents Organization and led to the firm's recognition as an innovator in marketing and in clothing design. We're going to go back a minute. Early 20th century was a time when women's lives began to change. Women finally had the ability to live uh, lives outside of the house and could spend time doing other things rather than the hard housekeeping work. Moreover, the expansion of the middle class created a demand for ready-made clothing. These middle class women had more free time, and some began working outside the home. This group of working women, including some single and some married women, um, ready-made maternity clothing were difficult to find. However, in about 1904, Lena Bryant became perhaps the first woman to make maternity clothing and to market them after she had received a request to make a dress that was practical for entertaining at home. Seamstress Bryant made other maternity dresses and sold them from her shop. But eventually she dropped the maternity line and her business grew into the first clothing manufacturing specializing in clothing for the fuller figured woman now known as Lane Bryant. Later, as the Depression lengthened, fewer women purchased ready-made clothing. Moreover, the lack of funds and the decreased need for work clothing forced women to simplify their wardrobes. Often, a single style was made to serve multiple situations, thus decreasing the demand for the maternity clothing. During the 1930s, women either purchased dresses in larger and larger sizes so that the dresses would cover the expanding middle, or they opted to wear a hooverette. Hooverettes were wraparound dresses that overlapped in the front so they could expand across the, the enlarging abdomen. Neither option was satisfactory since larger dresses had larger armholes, larger sleeves, larger shoulders, and longer lengths, creating a dowdy and unkept appearance. Hooverettes had no waist and hung vertically from the shoulders with a tie on the side. But as the women lo loosened the ties to accommodate the expanding abdomen, there was no way um, to cut for the garment to expand across the abdomen, thus it hiked up in the front and was shorter in the front than it was in the sides and the back. This dilemma set the stage for the beginning of Page Boy. 
In the 1930s, Edna Frankfurt worked as a secretary for Magnolia Petroleum Company. In 1933, she married Abe Rathkin, but continued to work. In 1936, when she was pregnant with her second child, her sister Elsie noted that instead of looking well-groomed and stylish, as she looked, uh, that she looked rumpled and frumpy. Elsie exclaimed, and this is according to most of the stories, I don't know whether it's true, that her sister looked like a beach ball in an unmade bed. <laughs> this situation created the inspiration which, which eventually led to the new and novel business plan for Edna Rafkin and her sister, sister Elsie Frankfurt. In most stories, Elsie claimed that she had just graduated from SMU when she uh, when she did uh, uh, when this incident took place however she had actually graduated two years earlier in 1934. Elsie had earned a double degree in mathematics and design and she believed that she could solve the problem of the expanding abdomen by using some of her engineers training. Stories differ about what happened next one says that she drew the pattern out herself, and another says that she actually took one of her sister's suits and cut it up. Despite the different stories, in the end, she designed a fitted skirt with a scooped opening, allowing the abdomen to expand through the opening. She created a drawstring, which would connect both sides of the waistband. A strap attached to the drawstrings and connected the bottom of the opening and helped the base stay in place. When Edna was walking, Edna was a walking advertisement. It wasn't long before they began to get requests from their friends for copies of the suit. At first, the dresses were made in a loft and sold only to friends. The first shop only had enough room for a small window, a small showroom, and one dressing room, and a, ti and a tiny uh, workroom in the rear. Edna and Elsie hired two seamstresses to do the sewing, and they designed the outfits and did the selling. The original design sold for $22.95 retail, and $12.50 wholesale. That was a lot of money in 1937. Yes. By the summer of 1938, the young woman had netted $3,000. This was about three months after they had opened their first store and they had netted about $3,000. And there's various stories about whether they borrowed money or didn't borrow money or, or how they, they got the, the money that, that started the, the whole thing going. Um, but they had already started turning a profit within six months. From this small beginning, Page Boy Company was born. But these sisters were no Texas twits. <laughs> Elsie realized that they had a novel idea, and in June of 1938, she and her sister filed for a patent so that they could pr protect their innovative design. Um, and the time frame, in, when Edna told these stories, she usually told the story like, I designed it and then I ran out to the attorney and patented it. But when you start looking at the time frame, when the first advertisements came out in the newspaper and when they, filed, they actually filed for the patent, it took her a year um, because the patent wasn't filed until 1938. So they had already opened their first store. The first advertisement uh, uh, appeared in December of 1937. So, so she had kind of compressed some of the time frame, like she did with her age. <laughs> the other thing I want to tell you is that obtaining a patent on a clothing design is difficult. You cannot patent fashion. The thing that they were able to, to patent was the idea of the of the construction of this garment and and 
So that was what they were able to patent. On December the 27th, 1938, E. Frankfurt et al. was granted a patent number 2,141,814 for a maternity garment ensemble. The patent gave them sole rights to this design, so nobody else could use this idea. Still using the jacket uh, over a cutout skirt as a model, they expanded their styles. They manufactured suits in silk, alpaca, linen, chiffon, cotton, and, and made the, the suits in solid colors and in prints. Uh, the basic jacket was designed and it eventually expanded from a kind of a tent design to something with pleats in the front and the back. The sisters later proved to be innovative at public relations and marketing. A friend visiting an Atlanta department store while wearing a page boy outfit sparked a man in that city and she took orders right on the spot. The sisters sent six outfits to Atlanta and those quickly sold. Within months, they had sent more to Atlanta and were selling um, outfits in, the, in New York City after a friend did a similar, pulled a similar stunt. By 1939, Elsie had become an expert at, mar at the marketer and began writing a column for the Dallas paper. In one column, she noted that pregnant women often hid under larger coats, even when it was warm outside, because they felt so unstylish while they were pregnant. She wrote that, she could, uh, that they could look stylish and advised planning a paternity wardrobe with multi-purpose pieces. She even provided examples, suggesting that a woman could purchase two items suitable for church and going out, and another for shopping and an afternoon of bridge. Now, of course, writing this kind of article also provided her with free publicity <laughs> and the company. In 1940, Edna uh, visited Los Angeles on vacation and saw what she believed was a perfect spot for a new shop. Located at 3022 Wilshire Boulevard, it was in the hub of the shopping area. She rushed to call Elsie about her find, so the sisters decided to expand their business and open an outlet in Los Angeles. After this move, the advertisements regularly appeared in the, in the Los Angeles Times. The youngest sister, Louise Frankfurt, returned from Champaign, Illinois, where she had graduated from the University of Illinois with honors. Louise had won a scholarship to study design in New York, but Edna begged her not to leave Dallas again. Edna argued that they needed a designer and wanted Louise to join the firm as the primary designer. The sisters decided that they wanted to maintain their business, so Edna, um, as they expanded, Edna moved to Los Angeles to manage the new store, but Elsie kept control. A Dallas Morning News column dated May 10th, 1941, titled To and From Dallas, mentioned that Elsie was leaving Dallas to visit her sister, who was now residing in Los Angeles. Soon the sisters began planning to open still another uh, store on the West Coast, and Luis went to Los Angeles to learn more about managing a shop. But after Pearl Harbor, Luis, Edna, and her family left Los Angeles and returned to Dallas. Just as the firm had embarked on an, a plan of expansion, World War II, began to impact retail manufacturing. Furthermore, war regulations forced clothing design changes and severely restricted the amount of fabric available to all manufacturers providing civilian clothing. Additionally, small companies were generally prevented from bidding on government uh, contracts 
thus limiting their sales. In fact, in December of 1941, the coordinator of the National Defense Purchases stated that small manufacturers were in serious trouble because their size prevented them from bidding on, on government contracts and their sales were limited. Now this was the man that it was in charge of, of um, the national um, procurement of manufactured goods. And this is what he's saying about, about small manufacturers. He also stated that it would be difficult for small manufacturers to get their raw materials. And in this case, we're talking about fabric. Despite later attempts by Congress to aid small manufacturers, these companies faced many barriers to continued operation. One of the more blatant actions the government, and it was under this gentleman that I just mentioned, took to was to attempt to centralize all clothing manufacturing in the New York area. So what this gentleman wanted to do was actually close down all the manufacturers anywhere except in the New York City area. He wanted to centralize it during the war. This step forced the Dallas Wholesale and Manufacturers Association to fight the War Production Board's action. By the end of 1942, the Dallas Wholesalers and Manufacturers Association obtained an injunction to prevent the consolidation of the garment industry in New York. If this action had taken place, all garment manufacturing, as I said, will have, would have ended except that in New York. By the spring of 1943, revised regulations limited the excess use of fabric, forcing design restrictions. So there was limit, there were there were design restrictions that stated what you could do with your fabric. So additionally, the use of trim was limited. Collars and pocket size was, was regulated. And sleeve width and length, along with the hip width of skirts, was restricted. So one of the things that they outlawed was large collars. And you notice in the 1950s, we went back and we were wearing big collars. This was as a, as a result of that. And we had very uh, tight skirts during World War II. And that was because that used less fabric. You couldn't have fabric over fabric. So patch pockets were, were outlawed. So all of these kinds of things were regulated as far as the designs were concerned. There were other changes also that impacted the marketing of, of goods. For example, no two garments could be priced as a unit. Um, so that means no suits could be sold. You could sell, sell a skirt, you could sell a jacket, but you couldn't sell them as a unit. Furthermore, war restrictions forced manufacturers to limit their sales to previous customers, or at least that's what they were told to do, supposedly preventing the expansion or growth. It is probable that many of the companies got around some of these restrictions. During the war, Elsie Frankfurt decided that she alone would travel to New York to purchase fabric. Later, she told her sisters, that they wouldn't pay the price that she paid. She added, you know what goes on in our world. This last statement alluded to the fact that most of the Dallas manufacturers were forced to pay bribes um, uh, during the war so that they could obtain fabric to remain in business. One way or another, Page Boy, though, managed to get enough fabric to satisfy their customers. And of course, they always had a good customer base since they were pregnant women. In 1942, the Page Boy Company had outlets in Atlanta, New York, Cincinnati, Chicago, California, and the Dallas headquarters. Even Hollywood recognized the distinctiveness of the designs because in 1942, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer announced that it would produce a short film entitled, What About Father? And the film featured maternity clothing manufactured by the Pageboy firm. 
Although many of the first outfits that Page Boy made were sold as high-end fashion, um, the war changed that. In 1942, Sylvia Weaver, a writer for the Los Angeles Times, described a budget wardrobe for uh, four to six pieces that would take a woman from summer into fall. This wardrobe would include a jacket, a skirt, slacks, which we think of as very avant-garde during the war, but women wore slacks, blouse and jumper, and it cost $22 total. The, so we've gone from, from $22 for one outfit to $22 now during the war for multiple pieces. The article reported that the, art, that the garments were designed by the noted designer Elsie Frankfurt. Okay. So during the war, Page Boy did not adver, uh, advertise their dresses, but they often advertised for workers, especially trained finishers. And this is one of their advertisements. So they couldn't advertise to sell, but they, could, but they needed workers because of the war, and there was a lot of competition for workers. So this is what I found in the paper. We like to work where it's a joy. You ought to see us at Page Boy. The rhyme of our power machines is set to music on the beam. We serve refreshments, prompt at three, fruit juice, and snacks for energy. We pay as well as others do, enough to buy a bond or two. For all the rest, there is no fee. Come in and look around, it's free. This, I thought that was original. I mean, you know, you're trying to get workers, here you are, writing a, writing a, a, a poem. Despite the war, in 1943, uh, Page Boy Manufacturing Company celebrated its fifth anniversary with a luncheon for its employees. The company operated the new manufacturing section at the, uh, of the business at 1816 and a half Main Street, but still maintained the retail shop in the Medical Arts Building. Page Boy, which began with two employees and a part-time cutter, now employed 15 women, women and a cutter. And they marketed both wholesale and retail. By the middle of 1944, Dallas Manufacturing was being recognized as the style center for women's sportswear. So we're talking about not just Page Boy, but in general. According to Lester Lorch, longtime leader of the Dallas Manufacturers Association, in the early days of the Dallas market, retail firms removed the manufacturer's label from Dallas-made garments because the retailers believed Dallas labels decreased the value of the garments. <laughs> Furthermore, in the 1920s and the 1930s, many of the major department stores refused to carry um, uh, clothing with designer labels because they only wanted the labels of their store in the garments. But by the end of the war, this belief, the belief that Dallas made garments were inferior, had changed. Despite war restrictions, the women's apparel manufacturers in Dallas grew phenomenally. With Dallas as a marketing center and the manufacturers themselves in a stronger financial position, 48 of the largest manufacturers in Dallas, including Page Boy, chartered a school of design at Southern Methodist University. Although Page Boy shared in the growth of the Dallas market, it differed from many, it differed, pardon me, from many of the uh, other manufacturers because the owners did not use middlemen to market their designs. Instead, they sold directly to retailer, cu retail customers in their own stores or they wholesaled, wholesaled their own designs. Moreover, Page Boy's owners and managers were young women, and this set them apart from other manufacturers in Texas. These differences limited Page Boy's involvement with other manufacturers in Dallas. As the decade ended, the Frankfurt sisters became nationally known business uh, women. 
Nevertheless, they were still women and subject to the prejudices of their time. The Morning News published an article entitled, Dallas-born idea grows into national business. Now that's our local, the, the local Dallas paper. And the first sentence began, two little Dallas spinsters and their married sister have parlayed a $500 nest egg and some mathematical principles into the, national, in, uh, into the nationally known page boy and eternity wear business. Surprisingly, these spinsters were about 25 and 35 plus, although Elsie would never admit that she was 35, and these women were hard-driving businesswomen, just like any business person with 250 active accounts. Furthermore, at this time, now we're talking about before the end of, 19, of the 1940s, Page Voice customers included and I'm going to name some people that the younger people in the audience might not know. <laughs> Betty Hutton, Alice Faye, Loretta Young, Margaret Sullivan, and Mrs. Allen Ladd, and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. So here they were already dressing these stars, Hollywood stars. About the same time, Time Magazine ran a short article about the firm calling it a merchandising sensation. By 1948, the firm employed 100 people, mostly women. According to one article, the firm now grossed over a million dollars and the sisters were netting about 10% of that. This was just an estimate since the company was privately held and the firm made no public reports. The article states that Elsie, the administrative director, does a little of everything, including purchasing and marketing. Edna operated as production manager and merchandiser, and Louise created the designs. In August of 1949, Page Boy opened a new, larger headquarters located at Cedar Springs and Olive Street. <coughs> Edna Frankfurt Rafkin and Louise Frankfurt had offices in the wholesale building, and, Ed and Elsie Frankfurt divided her time between Dallas, New York, and now San Francisco, where they were just opening a new shop. The new building housed expanded general offices, the factory, and a library with information about mater uh, maternal and baby care. The building also included an exercise area for employees and space for another for the Dallas outlet. The showroom was decorated by Neiman Marcus decorative galleries, indicating that the company was again targeting upscale women. The expanded plant allowed the firm to increase the number of employees and production by about 50%. By the end of the 1940s, Page Boy originated another innovative maternity design. This time, they inserted a zipper, and that's probably your innovation. But they in inserted a zipper into the skirt uh, so that the, the zipper could expand at the waist. These outfits could be converted to maternity use by opening the zipper and then back to regular ready-to-wear by zipping the zipper closed. Being able to convert a maternity dress or skirt to a normal dress or skirt provided women with a stylish outfit while they were pregnant and an outfit that they could uh, wear after delivery, perhaps when, their, when their, um, had, their body had not returned to the pre-pregnant size or perhaps when they had less money to spend on themselves. The Frankfurt sisters clearly sought publicity that would promote themselves and their business. So what better way to promote uh, the, the, uh, the business than a stork? 
So we've already using the stork in, in their design. So what better way to promote themselves? So late in the decade, they donated a pair of storks to the Dallas Park Zoo. The paper carried their picture alongside the zoo director as they presented the storks, which had just been flown in from California to Dallas. Addition, additionally, according to Louise Gardner, when the sisters traveled, they all carried matching luggage that had been made especially for them, and they wore matching travel suits. So they really stood out. In 1947, Elsie also scheduled a fashion show in New York. With her usual flair for the dramatic, she reserved the Stork Club, a famous nightclub, and hired a top commentator to do the announcing. Press releases about the show went out to all the media outlets. In May of 1950, Southern Methodist University celebrated the third anniversary of the Business Studies Program and invited local businessmen and the Frankfurt Sisters to speak to the classes. The Frankfurt Sisters spoke to the students about managerial problems, advertising, marketing. However, as the only women participating in this program, they also spoke about secretarial skills and training. When Louise became pregnant in 1951, her name not only appeared in advertisements, but her likeness also appeared in sketches and as a model for her own maternity uh, creations. The Los Angeles Times printed a story that proclaimed, a designer designs her own wardrobe. Another paper noted that Louise Frankfurt, Mrs. Charles Gardner in private life, designed maternity clothes with sophistication and flair. One of her new designs is a three-piece suit with a long double-breasted jacket using the zipper opening so that the slacks and the skirt could be con converted back to re regular clothing. In addition to innovative designs, Page Boy now manufactured maternity lingerie. To boost um, sales, the company published a free catalog for their sales. And I, there, there is a really funny story in the book that I don't have time to tell you about, try, about uh, the two older sisters trying to sell a bra, a maternity bra, to a customer. And um, so you have to get the book to find that story. <laughs> In August of 1951, the Young Presidents Organization announced that they would admit their first woman, Elsie Frankfurt, and honored her at a luncheon at the Prince George's Hotel in New York City. According to the newspapers, young, the Young Presidents Organization, or the YPO, membership now stood at 200 men and a girl. <laughs> Requirements for membership included being the president of a firm doing $1 million annually in gross receipts and being under 39 years old at the time of induction. Elsie claimed that she was only 33. <laughs> so we're talking about 1951 and she was born in 1911 and I'll let you do the act. Um, but I, so I, I know that Page Boy was doing over $2 million, but I doubt that, um, that Elsie was under 39. <laughs> Later that year, Elsie and five women who were members, of, and five men who were members of the YPO formed the Southern uh, branch of the, y, of the organization. By this time, the YPO included 240 men and one woman. That same year, Elsie Frankfurt, along with eight other women, were recognized as Young Women of the Year by the Mademoiselle magazine. Um, supposedly, all of these women were between the ages of 17 and 33 years old, <laughs> and, and had achieved distinctive records in their fields. The list of honorees included dancer Maria Tallchief, 
tennis star Maureen Connolly, actresses Maureen Stapleton and Shelley Winters, along with Elsie, <coughs> who, as we know, was over 33. <laughs> even though, even though Pageboy was profitable, was a profitable company. The sisters all remembered their father's admonition, never borrow money and never spend if you do not need to. The sisters stretched every dime and penny they earned in the business and they knew how to play the game. And as women, they stood out in business. For instance, they not only got free publicity, but they also got free lunches. Uh, when they dined at the weekly fashion show at the Stadler Hotel in downtown Dallas. One trick they used went like this. They ate lunch at the hotel, as did many businessmen. Most weeks, one of the businessmen, or even some of them, would offer to pay for their lunches. But if no one offered to pay, the sisters would start fumbling in their purses, looking for money. But they purposefully never carried cash, so they couldn't pay. Seeing their predicament, one of the gentlemen would always come to their rescue and pay their tab. One of the themes in the book is Elsie's constant secrecy about her age. And in fact, also in 1951, Alice Hughes, an, an syndicated writer for the King Features, wrote about Elsie. And this is about your mom, too. So in that article, she wrote, this is the, uh, the, the writer wrote, that Elsie was the youngest of the three Dallas sisters. <laughs> the elder sisters are married. By the beginning of 1952, Page Boy had shifted its design focus for, uh, from suits and dresses that were matched and sold as sets to separates. According to one fashion writer, the company offered suits in two skirt uh, or two skirts and a jacket or two jackets and a skirt, and this was considered a convertible design. The less formal fashion highlighted polished cottons, lightweight denims, and rayons. Emphasizing the new attitude, Page Boy marketed a $12.50 a month wardrobe, which would include interchangeable and mix and match um, pieces. Now, I will say that because of the Korean, Korean War, um, there was price controls on a lot of goods, so prices couldn't go up as much as you think they might have. And I'm going to skip part of this because I, I know we've, we've got to be, we, you know, we're, our time's short, so I'm going to, um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to skip some of this, and um, so during the 1950s, the Dallas apparel industry contributed about $15 million annually to the Dallas economy. According to, to both Louise Gardner and Ralph Seaman, whose children are back there and are my relatives, uh, many of the Dallas manufacturers had outgrown their working pool and were moving to surrounding communities such as Lancaster, McKinney, and Waxahachie. Nevertheless, the apparel manufacturers still made large contributions to the Dallas economy because the Dallas manufacturing firm attracted between 4,000 and 5,000 buyers each year to the market held in the city. Both Gardner and Zeman described the workers as middle-aged women who were looking for a way to earn some extra cash. They were not young women or mothers with small children. That's primarily. Although the seamstresses were women, the Cutters were always men. And in June of 1953, the Cutters Local 387 of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union filed a complaint with the National Labor Relations Board against Page Boy. And this was the only time that I could find any other th anything in the paper that was uh, derogatory, and this was proved to be wrong. The complaint stated that the company interfered with attempts to unionize the workers. An investigation 
was held and the preliminary findings supported Page Boy. And in November, the preliminary finding was upheld and the NLRB stated that there was no evidence of unfair label. Um, ever eager to learn more about business, Elsie Frankfurt enrolled in an advanced course in management held at the Harvard Business School that was sponsored by the YPO. And she attended these often. And as a present to herself, after she finished each one of these, she bought us a gold charm. <laughs> Shortly after the class, Elsie um, was photographed in New York along with Mrs. Errol Flynn. Flynn was purchasing page boy clothes for her trip to Rome to meet her husband. Never shy about using any form of publicity, the photographs were used for advertisement. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to go to the next part that I think is one of the most fascinating stories about Page Boy that I know of. The next account is one that I believe indicates just how forward thinking and bold these sisters were. In 1962, the sisters took a vacation together and they rented a bungalow at Rancho La Porta in Tecate, Mexico just south of the California border. <clears throat> After they arrived in Mexico, they discovered that Indra Devri, or Devi, the leading yoga advocate in the Western Hemisphere was offering classes at her nearby yoga institute in Takati. Since the sisters had come to relax and were ready, uh, were already interested in yoga, they joined her classes. Before meeting the Frankfurt sisters in Mexico, Ms. V had traveled around the United States promoting a program she called Yoga for Americans. She believed that Americans' lifestyle was filled with stress and she felt that Americans needed to learn how to relax. During her travel, she offered to demonstrate, she offered demonstrations and actively sought a factory or workplace where she might introduce a yoga break into the workday. Even after offering free lessons, she was unable to find any factory owner or manager willing to launch the program. This chance meeting with Louise, Edna, and Elsie brought the innovative page boy owners and the eager yoga instructor together. Thrilled by the revitalization and relaxation they gained by participating in Devi's regimen, the Frankfurt sisters decided to bring her to Dallas so that they could launch her plan in the Page Boy factory. In commenting about this trip, Elsie said that the sisters felt better, they worked better, they snoozed better, and even their figures were trimmer. The sisters returned to Dallas and outfitted all the employees from the secretaries to the janitors with their own yoga mats. They followed through with their plan and they brought the yoga instructor to teach classes at the Page Boy factory. So they brought the they brought Ms. Uh, Madame Devi here and she walked around the, the uh, plant and she observed all the workers and she cre created specific exercises for each division of the, co of the company so that the workers were able to remain in their own working areas and do exercises. Each session began with synchronized bead breathing and stretches. This was followed by relaxation exercises and the session ended with a general meditation period. Secretaries practiced relaxing their eyes and learned how to use their typewriter to support their elbows um, while holding their heads in their hands. Shipping clerks who worked standing on their food, feet all day were instructed in how to relieve the tension in their feet by doing a reverse posture. In this position, the workers laid on the floor with their legs raised parallel to the tables. The knees were bent over the top of the tables, elevating the body and their heels while their, their shoulders rested on the ground. This position flexed the legs at the knees and the hips and stretched the back without putting any weight on the, on the feet. 
Cutters and women who worked with them stretched out on the cutting tables. Where else? And the others stretched out on the floor. Elsie and Louise uh, served as models and demonstrated some of the positions and exercise techniques. Um, after the, the visit, the sisters wove the yoga break into the factory's daily routine. Each day, the Pageboy plant closed down promptly at 2 p.m. Um, and what happened was that the switchboard operator uh, would interrupt all calls at 1.55 with the announcement, the yoga break starts at 2 o'clock and the switchboard will be turned off. The janitor participated by lying down near the broom closet and even the controller John Fulda practiced at his desk, and William Mosier, the sales manager, practiced in the showroom. Retail customers and buyers from department stores who were visiting the Page Boy showroom to place an order were told that the business would stop. They could wait or they could join in the session. One of the sisters conducted the exercise regimen by calling it out over the loudspeaker. And if the sisters weren't available, an employee played a, rec a recording of the exercises. The yoga break did not replace the regular 3 o'clock work break, but instead supplemented it. This kept the employees happy. Ever the mathematician, with a sharp pencil, Elsie asserted that the break cost the company $10,530. Figured it out almost to the penny. Each year in work lost by the 150 employees. Nevertheless, she believed that the break contributed much more than it cost because it increased the efficiency and raised the employee morale. Now I want to stop here and I want to say what I believe that Louise, at, um, who spear, it was Louise who spearheaded the yoga break. She herself mentioned that and Penny Pollock, Edna's um, daughter, her stepdaughter, uh, and someone who worked for Page Boy for a short time thought that this was correct. However, when Edna was asked about it, she took credit for it and for this innovation herself. <clears throat> Page Boy weathered the difficult times of the 1960s when tent dresses and shifts would be substituted for maternity, for maternity clothes. But the company made a resurgence as more women entered the workforce. Elsie Frankfurt married and Louise Gardner retired from the firm to stay home with her growing children. From the middle of the 1950s, Page Boy hired well-known women to narrate their styles, their style shows, and used this for promotion. In 1957, Jane Meadows Steve Allen's wife and Audrey Meadows' sister um, not only narrated a style show, but wore page boy clothing uh, while she presented all the styles. They also sponsored um, the clothes for Florence Henderson while she was on, she appeared on the Today program. Uh, this was Dave Garraway's Today program a long time ago. And and every time at the end of the show, it, when, while she was pregnant, the voiceover would come on and say, Miss Henderson's ma a wardrobe, courtesy Page Boy Company. During the 1960s, the Kennedy women also wore Page Boy style, but these were the only women who Elsie ne uh, did not promote. She never used their names in any promotion. In fact, Jacqueline Kennedy wore a page boy dress while she campaigned for her husband during the 1960 campaign. That dress is now in the fashion collection at the University of North Texas. By the end of the 1960s, the manner of reaching customers began to change. Women seldom went to the central district business to shop. Instead, most women shopped in nearby stores. By the end of the 1970s, shopping centers sprang up around the periphery of cities and many malls were covered, making all day shopping a pleasant event, especially in the South and the West. 
department stores offered easy access and they all and they along with page boys competitors were easy to find page boy failed to make these changes later in the 1970s after elsie had married edna alone felt that she could not handle everything that was happening in dallas this included managing the main office the manufacturing center, the Dallas stores, and the wholesaling, along with everything else. At the time, Elsie argued that the wholesale business actually cost them money since they accepted returns. And I'll stop here and insert, I actually think this is not true because other firms were able to accept um, returns and still make money. So I think that um, Edna, and Elsie decided they just didn't want to do wholesaling anymore. Um, so they dropped the wholesaling. This step severely limited the places a shopper could purchase page boy dresses and limited the number of outfits sold. Thus the company contracted rather than grew. And it is my conclusion that this contributed significantly to the, to the collapse of the firm. Elsie and Edna remained actively involved with the firm until late in their lives. But as the women aged, in 1986, Elsie's stepson, Robert Pollock, came in to manage the firm. But the die was cast and nothing could be saved. In late fall of 1993, Robert and his fa father arranged for the sale of Page Boy to Mother's Work, and in early January of, 19, of 1994, the announcement was made. Both Edna and Elsie were not available for comment. So there's a lot more about the the. Um, the firm in the book. I just don't have time to tell all the stories. Um, they they had one section of clothes that were designed by um, uh, by Mackie, and they. I mean, it was just amazing what some of the things that Bob, Bob Mackie. <coughs> and it was amazing at some of the things that they did, um, but they. In the end, as it, because it was such a closely held business and they never brought in any additional management from outside, I think, that it just couldn't survive. And I can answer some questions. I can give you a little bit more information, but I, I'll try to answer questions. Uh, where did the name Page Boy Well, um, according to the stories, um, Oh, okay, sorry. So where did the, the term page boy come from? And according to the stories, uh, Edna and Elsie decided, or El Elsie, according to Elsie, Elsie decided that the, pa the little page uh, announced the, the, the birth of an heir to the king. And so they used that little, it was a little, man with a trumpet or a little boy with a trumpet and now they used that um, as their logo until about 19 the, the later 1980s and it changed the logo did change and they dropped that little little guy with the trumpet um, sometime after that I would be curious to see how many women in this room wore page boy Take off. You could take the panel off 
and then you could, and they, they sold it with the panel, so you could sew the panel back on after you weren't pregnant anymore. Um, there, there were some other designs. I think that one of them was kind of like golf pants, and um, where it, it enlarged on the sides where the pockets are, and, um, but, but I think that there were several other kind of designs that they, that they used. article um, uh, the question was it, there was a, a magazine a Jewish magazine in 1993 or 94 and and uh, the the lady said she was asking me if I had seen this article that she had written um, I I have the interview that she did here but I don't think if it, if I couldn't find it from the library uh, Right. The book in the book, I tell how forward-looking I, I did a lot of searching for other firms and um, and promotions of of health kind of health-conscious firms in 1960. And other than seeing a few articles that were written in places like Boston, there really wasn't anything else. I mean, I can't say that there wasn't, but I couldn't find documentation of, of anything else like that. And so that was a very, it was probably 40 or 50 years ahead of its time. And, um, and actually, um, it was written about in the the the, the yoga the, the 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 woman that taught the yoga wrote about Page Boy in her book that um, that she wrote about her own life. She wrote about Page Boy. How many stores does it have? Employees, gross sales. So so gross sales, I can't tell you since it was private, but I. I so it was fluid, and maybe 33, maybe 37. You could the their, um, their brochures would list the the, the stores, and um, and you would see one that would that would have one brochure that would be in say 75, and it might have 33, and the next one the next year might have. Uh, 37 and then it would go down to 34 and so um, it was constantly fluid but it never um, it, it, it they never got past that and one of the things that was very um, that was uh, Edna said that her father and I said this and had told them never to borrow money and the company never borrowed money and so it was, I would say, almost impossible for them to compete as, as the change in the marketing happened in the 70s when we had a lot of, you know, all these companies and everybody is having five or six stores in, in each town. They didn't do that. And so if you know, I don't, if you're a businessman, you know that marketing, you have to be close to your customers. And um, and unless you have something really, and they did have something outstanding, but the customer, the the average pregnant woman isn't going to travel halfway around Dallas to find a page boy outfit and um, or wherever it was in Los Angeles. If they had two stores in Los in the Los Angeles area, um, people just weren't going to travel that far. 
And once and they were selling it, they were selling in wholesale. So there were places like Saks that help that carried there and, and Frost. For those of you who may have known about Frost in, in San Antonio, and there was a store in I can't remember which one of the Sacklets or which store in Houston carried it. But once they stopped wholesaling, all of that ended. So $500 so that's another one of these stories. So they ask, where did the original $500 come from? And that's another one of these stories that you that has multiple stories. And um, and one of the stories, um, one of the stories said they borrowed it from their mother. They never told, according to what I could find, they never told their father until after it was a deed done. Um, but another story told that the that the sisters had the the money saved up, and they even borrowed some from their youngest sister, who wasn't in the in the in the business yet, but that they borrowed some from her. So, it, there were no there were no stories that the that the that were written by the people. But if, even if they had been, you know that self-reported stories aren't always. Exactly right. And um, the, it was 10 years after that, I think Collier's published a story about Page Boy in 1947 and time. So those were the, it was already 10 years past. Yes. I just want to comment on the quality. The quality was good quality. You could find horrible looking attorney stuff. And it was almost like it was made to wear and throw it away. But, but the page boy stuff was good quality, and you could pass it along to a friend or a friend could pass it down to you or something. Yeah. Gigi's sister told me about about the quality, but what, one of the things your sister said to me was that the, when she was pregnant the first time, between the first time and the, the last time she was pregnant, that she felt like the quality had not had not stayed the same. I don't know whether you've ever talked to her about that, but 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 she she said she said that to me. But I know I I, I mean I. I I never wore page boy, um, and I made most of my <laughs> most of my attorney clothes. Um, but but I know that that was that that was true. That it was it was fine quality. They also uh, there was one of the other innovations was that they had double seams, and I, I actually have seen one of the the outfits that had a double seam at UNT where. The, you could let out the seam, and so you got about four more inches of on the on the skirt. There was a question. Yes. I'm going to ask you, where did this? Who owns this wonderful display? And I invite all of you afterwards, carefully, to go through this. It's amazing what she has done. So, so Edna's stepdaughter, Penny Pollock. Elsie. Elsie. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Elsie. <laughs> Elsie's stepdaughter, Penny Pollock, um, gave me these and um, did not want them back after her death. And we talked, and they are all going tomorrow, and I've got like nine more. They're going to the University of North Texas at Denton because they already have started a collection of page boy clothes. And if any of you find a page boy in your closets or in your attics, or you talk to somebody that says, oh, I wore one and I put it away, they have about eight outfits or eight items there, including the dress that Jacqueline Kennedy wore. Um, it was donated by... <coughs> Excuse me. It was donated by the by Page Boy um, to the Fashion Institute it, right after right after she wore it. So I, I want to uh, there's one there's one more thing I want to do, and I want to read a list. If it's okay with you, with, I want to read a list of the people that 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 they used in publicity, except for 
for the Kennedy women. This is, the, these are all women that they used in publicity. Kim Alexis, Lucille Ball, Joan Bennett, Anne Blythe, Natalie Cole, Mrs. Ronald Coleman, uh, Jeannie Crane, Sandra D, Jill Eichelberry, Alice Fay, Judy Garland, Mitzi G uh, Green, Julie Harris, Florence Henderson, Gloria Henry, Mrs. Lamar Hunt, the only person I know from that was mentioned from Texas, Betty Hutton, Grace Kelly, Deborah Carr, Mrs. Ellen Ladd, Mrs. Mary Almanza, Mrs. Jerry Lewis, Ollie, Allie McGraw, uh, Dorothy Malone, Mrs. Dean Martin, Marie McDonald, Jane Meadows, Jane Nye, Deborah Norville, Helen O'Connell, Jane Powell, Mrs. Hal Roach, Debbie Reynolds, Gabby Rogers, Roxanne, Barbara Rush, Dinah Shore, Maria Shriver, Joe Stafford, Barbara Streisand, Margaret Sullivan, Elizabeth Taylor, Shirley Temple, Jack Webb, Mrs. Errol Flynn, Alice, uh, Mary Alice Williams, Shelley Winters, and Loretta Young. Wow. And so they were never shy about telling people who wore their clothing. Research. This has just been fabulous. And I, I invite you all to stop and have coffee and talk. And yeah, if, if Kay wants to talk to you, she, uh, there are some uh, pre publication notices there that you can sign if you're interested. And we have plenty of food. So thank you for coming. Thank mm -hmm.